Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Shah. I'm Dr. Maxfield. Welcome back to our channel. What do we do here? We have high yield medical facts, dermatology, skin care. And today we're going to be going over a example USMLE or Comlex question. And we're going to teach you how to dissect these questions in order to come up with the correct answer. And if you do this continuously on all your practice questions, you're going to see a lot of improvement. And so here we go. Here we go. Okay, so looking at the vignette, we're just gonna skim it. Um, we're just kind of just sharing our thought process as we go here. So neither one of us has read this question. All right. Previous healthy 22 year old college student, emergency department, 20 minutes, had a seizure. After the seizure, she's now confused. She's difficulty thinking, headache, cough. She had a fever for three days, treated with acetaminophen dextromethorphan. She's febrile. She has diffuse hyperreflexia. Uh -oh. Mental status exam confused, short-term memory deficits, still has more difficulty with nuanced things. MRI shows bitemporal hyperintensities. That probably means something to you. So background in radiology, lumbar. So actually, this is a way to sneak this in. I actually initially matched radiology out of med school, and then I ended up finding that it wasn't a good fit for me. And so I actually reapplied and entered the match for dermatology. And so I switched specialties. Actually, Dr. Maxfield also switched specialties. We'll talk about this later, but uh, just back to the question. So bitemporal hyperintensity is actually very specific. It actually means something to me too, even though I don't have as extensive a background in radiology. So now we do an LP, the CSF shows high red blood cell count, 340. I don't memorize these values. There are values I know just by repetition, like CBC, CMP, routine things. Know those cold, saves you time on a test. You're not just constantly looking at columns. This one I don't know, but in context, I know this is elevated. Leukocyte count is 121, with mostly made up of monocytes. Protein concentration also elevated, 78 milligrams per deciliter, which is the following most likely diagnosis. I have something in mind. So this actually is an interesting type of question, right? So when you do when you do these types of questions, in my mind, you know, I picked out a couple things and I'll tell you what they are. Okay, so she's young, um, she's having a seizure. So you think about either like congenital things, maybe brain tumors that happen in kids, but also infectious things. Infectious things happen to healthy people. That's something important to note. Um, she's febrile, so you're thinking now more infectious. Um, she's got memory deficits. These mean nothing to me. And then one of the key phrases here is the MRI of the brain showing bitemporal hyperintensities. This is so specific. Um, and then they show you a lumbar puncture that's abnormal with blood. And, um, and so you kind of start thinking about a diagnosis, uh, but you pick out a, pick out a couple things from this stem. Uh, but this type of question, how, how would you categorize this type of question? Uh, very simple first order question. Uh, I, I agree. This is a first, first order question. And also important to note that this is a fact-based question. And, and what I mean by that is that when you're studying and you get this question wrong, it's probably not gonna be a problem-solving issue that you have. Um, it's pro you probably are gonna identify this. So this is what I think. When you go back over a question and you get it wrong, you have to identify, was this a fact issue that I didn't know or was this a problem-solving issue that I didn't know? Uh, if it's a problem-solving issue, the answer is more questions. You got to do more questions. If it's a fact-based issue, you got to go back and study that topic. And so this is a fact-based question. It's asking about, so what's the answer? Herpes. I actually want to take a step back too. So he mentioned something when he was talking, there's something very characteristic in the stem, the, bi the bitemporal hyperintensities. If you find something in a stem that's extremely specific, latch onto it and run with it. Because like I said, when I was reading through it, everything after that point made sense contextually. If you have a very specific thing, run with it and then see if everything else just lines up and confirms what you already suspect. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have a different answer or do you agree? I know, I totally agree with your answer choice here. Um, uh, bitemporal hyperintensities is pretty specific uh, for herpes simplex uh, encephalitis. They affect the temporal lobes. And so, um, if you got this wrong, it's probably because you didn't know that fact. You go back and, and you review some of the some of the things uh, in the neurology section. Okay, take a second and talk about herpes encephalitis. Uh, I think one of the more common presentations is actually in a neonate. Uh, there is congenital herpes infections. There's neonatal herpes infections, which occur around the time of uh, delivery. So we need to look at how do you suspect the diagnosis? How do you confirm the diagnosis? What's the initial step in treatment? Or if there's a different one? What's the most appropriate or most definitive treatment? So how do you how do you clinically suspect herpes encephalitis? What are some key things you're looking for? Encephalitis. There's nothing super specific. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing super specific about the clinical presentation, except for maybe like a neonate born to a mother with genital herpes, right? Fever, confusion. Nuclear rigidity shirt, but just fever, confusion, meningitis, encephalitis, TTP. 
That's it. Then we suspect clinical diagnosis. So how do we confirm the diagnosis we suspect? So you could do a couple things. Uh, you could f- try to look for herpes, to get a PCR, get um, antibodies, uh, IgM antibodies, which show an acute herpes infection. You could do CSF, uh, which is probably going to be a more definitive diagnosis. You could even do a brain biopsy, which is going to be a pretty invasive test, so you don't want to go that direction. But usually if somebody has encephalitis, the first thing that you want to do is get a lumbar puncture. Nice. So perfect. Another testable point. Patients confused or has focal neurologic deficits, you have to get some sort of imaging to rule out a space occupying lesion before you get the lumbar puncture. Why is that? Because, oh, good. Okay, because if they have a space occupying lesion, the pressure is elevated in the CNS and there's a risk for brain herniation when you open up the bottom with the lumbar puncture. Mm -hmm. If the brain herniates, what does that cause? Death. Why? Respiratory failure initially because of compression of the midbrain and medulla. Medulla. Nice. Okay, so that was diagnosis with lumbar puncture, PCR. And we talked about treatment. We obviously aren't going to be using oral things in these patients. They're critically ill. So we're going to move to IV. IV acyclovir. Nice. IV acyclovir. But what do you have to worry about with IV acyclovir? Crystalline nephropathy. So what do you have to do? Hydrate. There we go. So that's your entire stem on herpes encephalitis. They give you the clinical presentation. Sometimes they give you imaging findings of bitemporal hyperintensities. Um, They're going to give you CSF findings of uh, viral um, pathology. And they may ask you, how do you diagnose this? They may ask you, how do you treat this? And they may ask you, what is the complication of treatment? And that would be crystalline nephropathy. And how do you avoid it? Adequate hydration. Love it. Thanks for tuning in. Like, comment subscribe, hit the notification bell. Like we said, we hit you with skincare content, but we hit you with medical content as well. So if there's anything that you'd like to see, please leave it in the comments. Uh, and we always appreciate your support.